Kopmo is our presenter today, and Stephen is an associate professor in the Department of Crop, Soil, and Environmental Sciences at Auburn University. He is their invasive plant extension specialist. Stephen has a Bachelor of Science in Agronomy from North Carolina State, go Wolfpack, a Master's of Science in Bioagricultural Sciences and Pest Management from Colorado State, and a PhD in Plant Biology from the University of California at Davis. Stephen has 17 years of experience in research and extension with noxious and invasive weeds across the U.S., and he currently is focused on invasive plants in the southeast U.S. It's my pleasure to introduce Stephen and Lowe. Okay, well, thank you very much, Tom and Holly. It is uh, very good to be, be here today. I see we're up to 181, 182 participants, and the list is still growing. Uh, it's wonderful to see so much interest in the topic. And uh, when Tom asked me to do this webinar, um, I decided in terms of herbaceous, troublesome invasives, I, I saw the topic was probably a little too much and decided to try to break it down and focus this webinar on invasive grasses. And so we may not cover every single invasive grass that you're interested in, um, but uh, what I've put together here I th hope will be very useful. Um, we will be taking questions, and so you can type your questions into the, into the Q&A box. Tom will, uh, will be in charge of those, and we'll come to some specific breaks within the uh, webinar, and we'll do our best to answer questions. I, I can't promise that I will absolutely get everything, but we'll do the best we can here. So let's move forward. So I would like to give a special thanks to Dr. Nancy Lowenstein, one of my colleagues here at Auburn, who, uh, who worked with me on putting this together. And uh, I want to give her a lot of props for this. Okay, so what we're going to do today uh, in terms of a discussion outline, and I, and, and I do want to answer questions, and I do, I'm very interested to hear some of the discussion points that many of you will indeed have. But sort of break down the overall concepts of the, of the actual problem in and around eastern U.S. forests of invasive grasses. We'll follow that in with the biology uh, and comparing key reproductive characteristics of, of several species. And then we'll try to link those up with management so that um, we can get maximum effectiveness in terms of the things we are doing in the field. And then we'll try to tie it all together and, and, and uh, answer questions and, and go from there, okay? Now, I'm a speaker who, who loves feedback from the audience. And it's uh, sometimes these uh, webinars are a little difficult to get that. Um, but uh, we'll do the best we can here. Okay, so some specific species I want to cover today. Kogon grass, uh, common reed, also known as Phragmites, golden bamboo, giant reed, also known as Arundo, a Japanese stilt grass, and Miscanthus, also known as Chinese silver grass. Okay, I'll speak up just a little bit. Here there's a, uh, I'm seeing that come in there. So. If you look at the eastern United States, we've got a pretty big area here with a tremendous number of ecoregions. This does not completely cover them all. I've listed several there on, on the right side of the slide. You, uh, you know them as, as well as I do on where you're located and within each ecoregion. And given the diversity uh, of folks we have on the webinar here today, your land management goals vary very widely, especially across ecoregions in terms of what you're doing. And so Basically, um, that's, uh, that's going to come into play here, but again, it's indicative that we can't cover absolutely everything, but, but we will do what we can. Okay, if we think about origins, history, and introductions of invasive grasses here in the east, and especially these species that I, I plan to cover, primarily we're dealing with several species of Asian origin, many of them from eastern Southeast Asia, uh, Arundo from a little bit broader area all the way to West Asia. But a lot of these grasses have been both unintentionally and intentionally introduced. And so we have lots of accidental contaminants, such as Kogon grass and Japanese stilt grass, which have come in with packing materials historically. Um, forages have been a big introduction point for a number of invasive grasses across the U.S. Here in the southeast, Kogon grass was tested as a, as a potential forage, turned out to be terrible. Soil stabilization is also another one widely utilized for introduced grasses. And then horticultural purposes um, have been very important for things like giant reed, a uh, number of bamboo species, including golden bamboo, and miscanthus. And then finally, um, sometimes we just don't know exactly how things got here. Common reed or Phragmites has a very complicated history here in the U.S. with native common reed and introduced European common reed. Telling these apart has been, uh, been very difficult. 
Um, I'm not going to get into uh, into the details of that today, but but I do want to cover uh, really what we're doing, what we can do about common read. Okay. All right. So hitchhikers, ma a major major issue. We like to say, uh, be careful who you pick up. And, and the history of this country, and the, within the settlement of the United States, we did have a lot of hitchhikers in the form of invasive grasses that came along, and um, a lot of them were introduced inadvertently, unknowingly. Um, and so it is a fundamental reality we st still deal with today as, as USDA APHIS attempts to, um, to inspect as much as they can to prevent new hitchhikers from coming into the country. But it is a reality. Again, forage and soil stabilization is a major historical problem associated uh, with, with many grasses that were introduced. And then finally, horticulturally, um, Grasses play a key role within a lot of horticultural landscapes, and they, ha they are a key element in a lot of landscape designs. And, and let's face it, bamboo is, is downright attractive to a lot of folks, as are grasses like Miscanthus and Arundo. And so that exotic uh, look ha that has often been desirable within horticultural landscapes ha has been a big player. And although a lot of horticultural species cause zero problems as an invasive, Unfortunately, these have sort of escaped and uh, are causing major problems now. This one slide really says it all. When, when you set up a situation uh, where you've introduced a lot of, of, of non-native species, land use change we know greatly enhances opportunities for invasion. And so any types of habitat fragmentation. And this one aerial photograph from Western North Carolina we have a major highway system going through. We know that highways are fantastic dispersal corridors, especially for invasive grasses. We have power line rights of ways. You can see running, uh, running. I put the arrow on it right there, running up and down the mountains. We have uh, logging uh, roads and, and situate trails um, here uh, on the top. We have urban development or exurban development um, where where we're, we're breaking up the forest and bringing in lots of, again, non-native species and, and creating tons of opportunities. And then trails that often run uh, that we're dealing with within an, um, a number of uh, situations throughout the east. So it's a reality we face that um, all, of, all of these things can indeed promote and favor the spread of a lot of invasive species, including the invasive grasses. And so it's just something that, that we have to fundamentally recognize that is, is really, this is the way the landscape looks today. In terms of silvicultural practices, uh, Chris, Chris Evans and his co-authors uh, several years ago published a fantastic guide in terms of invasive plant responses to silvicultural practices across the south. It, um, the information in here is very good at, at detailing exactly what forest managers can do recognizing how these practices can promote invasives and exactly what they can do to prevent encouraging invasives in a number of different situations. This is available online at invasive.org, and I strongly recommend you, you go there and take a look at it, and you can download this thing for free. So we've talked about origins, introductions, and why, um, why we have the problem. The impacts are widespread. And within the audience here of now 211 people, you will, many of you will have seen and experienced everything from minor alterations locally to literally complete ecosystem transformation from different invasive grasses and all along the spectrum. What we tend to see across the literature uh, as we review it for invasive grasses, as they invade a system uh, from the initial patches uh, to complete ecosystem expansion, they tend to form typically monotypic stands where not much else grows in them. They tend to be very aggressive, very competitive, and this rapidly results in reductions in plant species richness, so number of, of native species especially, and diversity across landscapes. Invasive grasses tend to strongly change disturbance regimes. Okay, so they often create very continuous, fine fuel layers. We get buildup of litter and thatch. Uh, each and every winter, typically, as, uh, as they tend to dry down. And of course, when you have such a continuous fine fuel layer, the inevitability is frequently increased fire frequency with very hot fires for some species. So we see that uh, linked in as they form monotypic stand and, and change that disturbance regime and tend to burn very hot. 
It's inevitable also that they're going to alter nutrient cycling and alter microbial communities. Uh, we often see changes in, in nitrogen cycling and carbon cycling when we have invasive grasses come in. And so all these things kind of tie together, and we have lots of feedback mechanisms that, uh, that really drive the establishment and dominance of invasive grasses within a number of our forest systems. Some big things especially um, that, that are being more and more recognized is, is not just inhibition of the herbaceous understory layer that we have in forests, but it's also overstory uh, regeneration is, is lacking. And we have documented uh, the losses of both conifer and hardwood establishment and growth for specific in, invasive grasses once they get established. We've seen this with Kogon grass. We've seen this with Microstegium. And, and it is a real problem. It's kind of hard to, to really fathom sometimes how a little tiny grass can actually limit our tree recruitment, uh, but, we, but it does happen. And after you get a lot of invasive grasses established, they do begin to alter your management options. And uh, prescribed fire being an extremely useful tool across a number of forest systems, um, especially in the southeast. But uh, when things like Kogon grass come in, it really changes your ability to effectively use fire. So there are many more impacts beyond these, but this is kind of just an overview uh, of really what you're dealing with and, and some of the bigger picture things that tend to happen with invasive grasses. Kogon grass, again, is a fantastic example of just about all of these coming into play. Imperata cylindrica, Southeast Asian grass introduced about 100 years ago, forming very dense monotypic stands. Um, located primarily in the deep south, uh, with the epicenters being in, Ep in Florida, Mississippi, and Alabama, with patches and, and populations expanding to the north, uh, all the way west into Texas, and into uh, Georgia and South Carolina now. As I mentioned before, Kogon grass definitely changes the business of fire. And within uh, many of our, our, our conifer forests, uh, Kogon grass can create fire conditions that are very detrimental, but yet it is pyrogenic in nature with positive feedback mechanisms, and so that a month after burning, uh, we have severe tree injury, and we have 100% ground cover of Kogon grass after that fire. When you take an aerial view of Kogon grass in the southeast, uh, this is from Baldwin County, Alabama, and you can see all those circular clonal patches that are expanding and coalescing to form literally what we call large imperata sheets. And in Southeast Asia, where Kogon grass is native to, these things can cover 15 to 20,000 acres at a time. We don't see that type of, of coverage here in the U.S. yet. But Kogon grass is kind of a, a, a picture that's reminiscent of what we see out west with downy brome or cheatgrass, Bromus tectorum, where everything you see from this aerial photo in that golden color is all cheatgrass. And it has invaded the Great Basin and changed the fire, um, the fire frequencies and, and fire return intervals, resulting in the complete devastation of sagebrush communities across the west. So Kogon grass is our, kind of our version here in the east and southeast of what cheatgrass has done out west, and um, it is very concerning. Now, a second species to cover, Miscanthus, uh, the Chinese silvergrass, uh, Latin name Miscanthus sinensis, a horticultural species that has clearly did not stay where it was put. And uh, it has escaped, especially along roadsides and, uh, in several areas. This is from Ed's Maps um, on the uh, Southeast Epsi website. Um, this is uh, voluntary data that's been reported for Chinese silvergrass escapes. Uh, these are not uh, from ornamental plantings, but these are out in the wild and natural areas. And you can see a tremendous number of reports of Chinese silvergrass across especially North Carolina, Virginia, eastern Tennessee, West Virginia, uh, right on up the east coast there, and then all the way southwest into Louisiana. So this is a species with uh, considerable distribution already, uh, but a lot of, of potential ground to, to catch up. Miscanthus tends to uh, really proliferate along forest edges and in open grasslands and um, tends to uh, form very dense, uh, dense canopies um, of, of very, very tall grass right there on the forest edge. In addition, Miscanthus is being studied extensively in terms of bioenergy production, so along with species like switchgrass, the native, but also things like Arundo donax, uh, elephant grass in Florida and Georgia, and, uh, and Miscanthus. Uh, um, and you can see here a picture of, uh, of a test site 
evaluating a number of different collections of Miscanthus sinensis. So you can see there is tremendous diversity uh, within the Miscanthus sinensis that we have here in the U.S. And uh, this, uh, this has, has caused some concern among a lot of folks regarding the potential for escape from bioenergy plantings, and it's an issue that continues to develop and be studied. Golden bamboo and other invasive bamboos. Golden bamboo is probably one of the most common Phyllostachys aurea, um, and classically associated with old homestead plantings from many, oftentimes many, many years ago. Uh, a very uh, novel species that, that folks have, have planted in, among a lot of uh, horticultural plantings as a running bamboo with creeping rhizomes. It has readily escaped and creeps out from established plantings or where old homesteads were abandoned. We now have populations out in the middle of nowhere, and you often see these things uh, all over the southeast, uh, especially the deep south from Texas uh, to Florida, but then all the way north up into Connecticut, I'm sure there. And so it's out there, and uh, you'll find it's one of our more difficult species to get rid of. You often see large, dense roadside stands. A lot of these may have originated from old homestead plantings, but when you dig back into these types of stands, you won't see a whole lot growing underneath a very dense stand of bamboo. Now, some folks have made the argument that bamboo really doesn't get into the woods. Uh, that's not the case. And uh, you can see here um, a very clear example of, of how golden bamboo has invaded and infested mixed hardwoods. Japanese stiltgrass, Microstegium viminaeum, um, kind of a, a unique uh, typically short-statured uh, annual grass species. You look at, you look at a, a wimpy little grass like this and wonder how in the world it could ever be a problem, and then you actually get out there within the entire eastern U.S. and realize that it is capable of completely taking over the understory of a tremendous number of different hardwood systems. If you look at the EDS map reporting data for Microstegium, uh, just sort of gasp and take a deep breath there as you can see that uh, it utterly dominates and has been reported literally all across the eastern U.S., uh, heaviest in, in sort of the mid-Atlantic mid, mid region there. And giant reed or Arundo donax, again, a horticultural species that is really popping up on a lot of folks' radar across the east these days. Uh, if you look at Ed, Ed's maps reporting data, you can see that it has been reported um, all over the southeast. Uh, really the big concerns with Arundo donax or giant reed is what we know it has done in the western United States, in California, Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico, and Texas especially, uh, where it has caused immense, immense problems and has been very devastating out there. Um, but we have it all over the east, and so guilt by association, if it's invasive elsewhere, is often a good predictor of, of its invasiveness here. Um, and so then so we see the stuff all over the place. We're worried about it establishing near water. I understand that, uh, that you know, river systems and stream systems are exceedingly different here in the east and south than they are in the western U.S., and we also see it on roadsides and, and invading forest edges. But um, really, go out to Texas, go to California, and you see things like this. This is Giant Reed or Arundo on the Rio Grande River in Texas, where you literally have uh, thousands and thousands of acres of solid monocultures of Arundo. Now, I'm not absolutely predicting that's going to happen across the eastern U.S., but it certainly does make us pause as we see what this species is capable of. And finally, common reed or Phragmites australis. Again, having a very complicated history here in the United States, uncertainty as to its native and non-native status, now recognized as, as having both native and non-native uh, types uh, established across the U.S. Uh, very, very broad in its ability to invade everywhere from roadsides all the way to, uh, to uh, wetlands, where you can see it has aggressively formed very dense monocultures and a very tough species to deal with. If you look at Ed's Maps data for uh, this species, it, it's kind of lacking. A lot of that may be due to confusion over native and non-native statuses. Um, but along the East Coast, uh, the common reed is, is exceedingly problematic. Um, but we also do see it uh, all the way to the West Coast and, and California and, and up into Washington. OK, right here is a very good stopping point to, to answer a few questions. Um, what do we have? 
The only question I see so far is a request to please discuss specific grass okay. herbicides, and excellent. we will get to that. Fred, Fred Huber, excellent question, and we will get to that. Uh, I've got I've got a, some definite things I want to say about the fops and the dims, and uh, and so we will come back to that question. I will address that very specifically. Okay. All right. Any other questions at this time? And uh, feel feel free to type those questions into the chat box, and we'll pass those along. All right. Okay, folks. Let's keep it rolling then. So we're on time, doing well, and uh, here we go. Okay. The fundamental reality with all of these invasive grasses, and you all will know this from a lot of frustrating experiences in management, the reproductive biology and ecology are the things that continually thwart us from finding that silver bullet for invasive plant eradication. We all want eradication, the complete elimination of all living propagules of a species. We want eradication on our properties that we manage. We want them eradicated from entire forest areas, from states, from the entire region, or even from North America. The larger the infestation, the more difficult eradication is. So in most cases, the cat, well, the cat's out of the bag. A Pandora's box has been opened, and there's no getting a lot of these out of the U.S. However, we can very effectively manage. We can locally eradicate incipient infestations. And so there's, there's lots of encouragement in the fact that it's not an absolute hopeless cause. But a lot of times when I talk to people and, and, and give advice on invasive plant management, I find there are some basic biology information that, that, that folks often just are not familiar with and have not paid attention to. So I really want to cover um, several different aspects in terms of sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction for these, uh, for these invasive grasses specifically. I put some tables together here. Now, I think you, you might uh, go blind and run away screaming if I were to read through these entire tables, but I've provided this information as a reference for you. When we talk about this specific set of species, Japanese stiltgrass is an annual. The rest of these are perennials, meaning that they are the annuals reproduce by seed only. The perennials uh, can often reproduce by both sexual and asexual means. In terms of pollination and breeding systems, Japanese stiltgrass is both self-pollinated with cleistogamous flowers that never actually open and cross-pollinated so through uh, typical open flower pollination or chasmogamy. Common reed um, is cross-pollinated actually with some self-pollination and possibly even apomictic, meaning it, it um, is a, a form of uh, sort of clonal seed production um, where, where gametes are not fused. Miscanthus, uh, we do know it is, is cross-pollinated and generally self-incompatible, and even possibly some horticultural cultivars have been reported to be apomictic. Kogon grass, completely self-incompatible, requiring cross-pollination. And finally, an arundo, which has no known uh, seed production here in North America. And bamboo is a, a very interesting case. Uh, we know so little about bamboo flowering because it happens so rarely. Many bamboo species may flower every 70 years on decadal scales. There are populations of bamboo that have been planted in test gardens here in the U.S. since the 1920s that uh, might have flowered once in that time period. And so these, these, uh, these pollination and breeding systems will, will often come into play in regards to management. Seed production, we know still grass is very widespread, making lots of seed. Common reed, not so much. Very variable for miscanthus due to that, that uh, self-incompatibility and cogon grass too. One thing I will say is even with self-incompatible species though, the more establishment you get of individuals, the higher the seed production is typically going to be as those opportunities for outcrossing increase. And that is definitely what we're seeing with cogon grass across the southeast. Arundo, again, nothing, and, and golden bamboo is so extremely rare in terms of flowering, it's even hard to study. Wind and water are the two primary dispersal agents for a lot of these grasses. And this flooding is, is just a nightmare, especially for things like stilt grass, because you do your best to manage it. And the next time the flood waters rise, you get an entirely new crop of seed coming in. And so it's hard to stop wind dispersal. Some folks have advocated planting very dense shrub, uh, shrub layers on the edge of forests as a means of deter deterring wind dispersed seed to some success, uh, but uh, it's not a perfect solution. It may not fit your management goals. But the wind and water dispersal from natural 
uh, means are, are really headaches for a lot of these species. And that is beyond all the anthropogenic type uh, methods of dispersal. Um, seed bank longevity with grasses in general is often relatively short, so we're not dealing with leguminous seed banks that last 50, 75 years. And a lot of these grasses uh, are extremely short-lived in their seed banks of, of a year or so. Some reports of still grass being three to five years. But this is a good thing, and it is encouraging for local management that we're not dealing with a long-lived seed bank and that, um, and that we can get on top of these things. So as I mentioned with Kogon grass, um, most of these annual grasses, or most of these uh, invasive grasses have very small seeds. And I just wanted to show you a few pictures here. Of uh, This is a Kogon grass, and you can see that the, the individual uh, spikelet there is tiny, and the fruit itself is about a little bit over two millimeters. You can see three flower heads there in the Petri dish with literally hundreds and hundreds of germinating Kogon grass seedlings. Here we have common reed, Japanese stillgrass, and miscanthus fruits. And you can again see we're on the millimeter scale here, and these things are absolutely tiny, which is why wind dispersal is often so effective. Now, if we then move to uh, really the thing that, 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 uh, that is the driver for a lot of these, and that's asexual reproduction. And that is often from um, rhizomes underground creeping stems or stoloniferous growth of above ground uh, lateral, lateral stems. And um, you can see as an annual, stiltgrass has no rhizomes. It, it has been described as, as having stolons, but uh, really I think rooting at the nodes is probably the, a better descriptor of, of what stiltgrass is capable of doing. But you can see that common reed, of uh, Kogon, Arundo, and Golden Bamboo have very extensive creeping rhizome systems. Miscanthus has more of a Sinensis has more of a compact branching rhizome system that actually creates more of a bunchy or bunch grass type growth form. So individual clumps as opposed to a sod forming type species. Now, rhizome depth is one of those things that you get in the literature and you will find wild estimates all over the place for some of these species. In general, most rhizome growth is typically within the top 12 inches for most of these. However, in anywhere you have sediment that comes along and buries rhizomes. Common reed has been reported to regenerate from rhizomes buried as deep as 30 feet under alluvium. Arundo has been re reported to generate from rhizome fragments buried three to 10 feet. And so, um, and so it, it's something that you really need to pay attention to within management because I get a lot of reports of folks saying, I've been spraying that, that every, every year for the last 20 years and can't kill it. But they've never taken a shovel and dug down to find out exactly what kind of rhizome mass you're dealing with. We often say that roots and rhizomes are the hidden half. With these species, they're often way more than half, oftentimes occupying 70% of the total biomass. And so when you have 70% below ground and only 30% above ground, um, you've, got a, you've got a much greater problem to deal with. The data on older established infestations having deeper rhizomes for these species is very unclear and very uncertain and it's not been reported for most species. So we can't always clearly say that the oldest patches will have the deepest thickest rhizomes because that hasn't always been the case um, but we do often make the argument that older patches are indeed more difficult to control. Again when you look at data for rhizome spread for some of these it's kind of all over the place reports for common read of of you know about a one and a third to six feet a year, uh, since miscanthus is very compact, very short rhizome spread. Kogon grass six to nine feet. Arundo unknown. I did not see a good estimate, uh, but oftentimes you see Arundo stand slowly creeping out. Golden bamboo or running bamboos, uh, you know, ten feet a year reported. Sometimes ten to people have even claimed up to twenty feet a year that those rhizomes are capable of running out. And I can't disagree with that if you've had that experience. Um, then, I, then I will believe you. Stoloniferously, most of these don't have stolons except for common reed, which can have extensive stolon production. And in terms of rooting at the nodes, this is another one that comes into play. Arundo donax, very, very effective. Oh, if you lay, lay a, uh, a cut stem down on wet soil, you can see rooting, or if you put it in water, you can see rooting and establishing of new plants. That doesn't happen with miscanthus, golden bamboo, um, and again, I think it's uncertain, and I may have left it out there for common read. Okay, so, so really, it is often below ground what we are 
truly struggling with. I want to show you some pictures of this. This is common reed rhizomes. You can see that very dense mat going down probably about 18 inches in this case um, and uh, extremely thick, heavy mat of rhizomes. All of these rhizomes are capable of regenerating new plant material, so it's really easy to see why even 95% control or 95% kill still leaves a tremendous amount of living rhizomes that regeneration can occur from. This is really why a single herbicide treatment almost never works uh, completely, and uh, you often are required uh, to go at it for several years. Here's, here's a, the stoloniferous growth from Phragmites or common reed, and you can see these stolons laying uh, running across the soil surface, rooting, and establishing new plants that way too. So you can literally have a network of, of common reed uh, occupying uh, the soil through rhizomes and running across the top of the ground with stolons, uh, resulting in those very dense ferment mats of, uh, of reed. Right here is miscanthus. Um, rhizomes are typically with, with these perennial grasses are produced very quickly, and they form a very dense rhizome mass even within one to two years. This is first year miscanthus rhizome production, and you can see that bunchy type, tight clustered short rhizome uh, that you typically see with miscanthus. But and within a year, this thing has already established a rhizome mat about eight inches deep and uh, very, very thick. And again, Kogon grass, a much smaller rhizome, very tiny um, uh, in terms of small cylindrical white covered in a, 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 a leaf like sheath. Um, typically going down about four to eight inches um, when you start digging and measuring, and I strongly recommend doing this. Get a shovel out there in any of these perennial patches. Find out the rhizome depth you're dealing with and the, um, the, the biomass below ground, and it'll really begin to, to help you understand the depth of the problem you're dealing with. Take a look at that bottom right hand, left hand picture, and you can see literally that every single one of those nodes uh, is capable of producing a new plant. And so you don't often see this um, because many of those are maintained dormant uh, through apical dominance until some type of disturbance begins to release them. But it goes to show that if you get rid of, again, 95 to 99 percent, there's still adequate rhizome for reinfestation if you don't follow up. Now, in contrast from very tiny Kogon rhizomes, here we have giant reed or arundo rhizomes. And, and if you've ever dealt with these, they can be absolutely enormous. You can see that somebody's holding those in their, in their hand there. Um, and uh, that picture on the right, you can sheer, see the sheer size of these rhizomes. And they form a very thick, dense mat. Uh, they're often very sort of abnormal looking. They don't have that very uniform rhizomatous uh, growth that Kogon has. They're often thick, swollen. And these are absolutely loaded with energy. And they have tremendous energy reserves. All of these peren creeping perennials do. And so they, they are, have a lot of fuel in the tank to uh, tolerate a whole lot of disturbance. Here's a great picture, a great example of, of leaving small pieces of rhizomes behind after management on the left there. And you can see uh, very short pieces of Arundo Donax rhizomes uh, that are re-sprouting. So in some sort of mechanical removal, these were left and very clearly can re-sprout and produce several new shoots from relatively small rhizome pieces. Here you see on the right uh, that Arundo is one capable of strongly rooting at the nodes. And uh, this, this floating uh, stem actually got hung up, and, and, and uh, you begin to see uh, new sprouts coming from essentially all of those nodes. And also bamboo. Um, bamboo, the, the nightmare that it is, running bamboos have, uh, have very strong rhizominous growth. Each spring, they form buds. Uh, on the rhizomes, these buds then shoot, and bamboo goes through the shooting process, whereas those new shoots attain their maximum growth within about four to eight weeks from most uh, bamboo species before they generally form many new leaves. And so you have a situation where in the spring, massive reallocation of energy reserves from the rhizomes up into that new shoot growth uh, b before they leaf out and begin to photosynthesize. And following that, uh, we get uh, tremendous running growth of the rhizomes as they continue to expand out from the main patch. This picture on the left um, is one of those uh, that's very common when we get uh, complaints about bamboo coming under somebody's fence or onto somebody else's property. And even when you use barriers, uh, you can see that tremendous rhizome growth that is pushing against those barriers. And, you know, these running bamboos, they just never stop. 
and so uh, you can you can hope to contain them, but uh, it is often exceedingly difficult. And, and this is just a good example of the sheer rhizome mass that is constantly pushing out, ex trying to expand, trying to increase uh, that stand. Here you see that happening out from large bamboo uh, uh, circular clones, and you can see all these new shoots out 10, 15 feet from the patch edge. And these new shoots have yet to leaf out. Uh, but these are all literally from rhizomes that have expanded out from the patch itself. And uh, this occurs each and every year, and in the spring you see this type of new shooting occurring. Okay. Let's see, was that, uh, Tom, was that the point I wanted to stop at next, to take any questions at this point? Yes, I think so. Uh, and um, we'll get into we methods. have one all right. from uh, okay. Marsh Hughes. What is the germination temperature for stiltgrass? Oh, boy, okay. You, you caught me with that. Um, Season-wise, stiltgrass is reported to germinate often as early as March. Um, but so, so typically those are pretty cool temperatures. I think maximum germination is going to occur uh, later into the spring and early summer. And um, so it will germinate over a wide range of temperatures because we, we do see uh, stiltgrass continue to come on. Um, but in March, oftentimes temperatures are going to be uh, in a lot of places, either in the 50s, and um, and so I don't know what that base germination temperature is off the top of my head. I could look that up for you later and get back to you on that um, for sure. But it, it can happen um, quite early uh, in some parts of the country. In the colder parts of the country, I think that is going to be a little bit later in the spring. Next question from Kelly Cairns. In Wisconsin, our most common invasive grass in forests, especially in floodplains, is reed canary grass. Any advice on getting trees regenerated after reed canary grass has exploded after a timber harvest? Oh boy. Okay, I, I did not incorporate reed canary grass uh, in, into this talk, and and Kelly, let me uh, let me think about that one and get back to you at the end of the seminar, um, because uh, reed canary grass is is, a, is yet a, another very aggressive beast uh, that we are dealing with, and so I, I will come back to that at the very end. Okay. D. Price asks, how do these invasive grasses relate to Johnson grass and dealt with as a noxious weed in the Northeast? Okay, well, Johnson grass is, is another uh, warm season grass that was introduced um, purposefully, <laughs> and um, unfortunately it did not stay where it was put. It turned out uh, not to be desirable, but escaped and became one of the worst invasive uh, plants we have um, across a lot of the country now and has definitely spread northwards. Um, Johnson grass is another rhizomatous grass species with a, a pretty thick rhizome system, nothing comparable to Phragmites, but it also flowers and produces a lot of viable seed. And so we often see it moving up and down roadsides. It typically does not like shade, so it doesn't get into the forest so much, um, but within agricultural systems, uh, hay fields and roadsides and rights of ways uh, as a very tall statured perennial grass can cause tremendous problems. Rod had a question. Are your distribution maps current? We have common read in New York, but it does not show on the map. Yeah, Rod, excellent question. And I mentioned this before that those uh, EDS, EDS maps are voluntarily reported data. And anyone can, can register on EDS maps and report. Uh, distributions of a tremendous number of invasive plants. My purpose uh, in showing those EDS maps was, was to short, sort of show a general distribution, and you're exactly right. There is tons and tons of Phragmites uh, where you are, no question about it. And, uh, and I'll mention it again, um, this, it's an opportunity for, uh, for folks to volunteer and contribute to the better mapping uh, of species like Phragmites where clearly uh, we are deficient in that area. So yes, I agree 100%. Those are all the questions now. All right. OK. Good deal. Um, I see one there from Tom Vorak. Are any of these roots rhizomes edible? OK, does anybody a fan of bamboo shoots? Apologies to Tom. <laughs> That's OK. So there are some species of bamboo that are definitely edible, moso bamboo for sure. Um, the newest, uh, as the rhizome tips emerge in the shoots uh, and turn into shoots, they, those things are, are edible. And um, so, yes, they are. Um, in terms of other, other rhizomes being edible, um, I would 
love for anyone to contribute who's ever eaten any of these <laughs> roots or rhizomes and tell me how they taste. Um, but uh, I don't see a lot of interest in, in consuming most of these things. And I do see one more question from Robert Piper. Sure. I'm in western Pennsylvania. Can stiltgrass freeze out at any time? Um, western Pennsylvania can stiltgrass freeze out, say, with an, with an early frost. Um, I guess if you had an early germination uh, with, a, with a severe late hard frost, I think you might get some mortality there. But it would have enough of a seed bank to recover from that. It typically will have produced seed in the late summer, early fall. So, um, so before your, um, before the fall frosts begin, it will have already uh, produced viable seed, which will tolerate winters no problem at all. All right. I think we could move on now. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, management options. Okay, cultural, physical, biological, and chemical options. Again, there's no silver bullets. When we talk about cultural, you know. If it, you wouldn't be here if you didn't already have the problem, we say an ounce of prevention is worth about a million dollars a week control. That is indeed the case, and we really do push the idea of early detection, rapid response, stopping new infestations, and implementing best management practices that are going to minimize weed spread. Fire plows, uh, you know, don't plow through Kogon grass. On your roadsides, recognize uh, if you're not managing on your roadsides, you're spreading a lot of seed that way. Microstegium is a bad one for that. Um, just a number of different ways. They're common sense, they're, but they're often very frustrating in terms of management to do. Washing equipment off, uh, making sure you're not planting contaminated seed, and making sure you're not planting or encouraging the growth of, of, of invasives uh, that are actually known to be invasive. So lots of cultural things. A lot of you are already doing the best you can there. Uh, education of, of neighbors and adjoining landowners. You'd be surprised at, at the lack of knowledge and, and understanding a lot of folks have. They don't recognize the problems invasive cause, and so it's a good opportunity for you to reach out and, and educate them. And uh, we've always found that uh, it's a whole lot better. Education is better than confrontation, and so get them on the same page uh, before you before you jump down their throats. <laughs> okay, so if we think about different physical types of, of control strategies, and many of you have implemented lots of these, what I've tried to do here is summarize a lot of the literature um, regarding uh, mowing, burning, grazing, hand pulling, digging, all these physical types of control. Mowing is, is effective um, within pre-flower timings uh, for Japanese stiltgrass control. I know there is some Clystogamous seed that's produced earlier, uh, but in general, um, as a late summer flower, you've got a pretty good window to get pretty good suppression of stiltgrass with mowing. For common reed, some folks have reported mowing for three years in a row did it. Other folks, two, two times a growing season for two years from Miscanthus. But um, for everybody who's reported this as effective, I've had people who say that they mow, they mow nonstop and don't get rid of it. Kogon grass, really, uh, Arundo and Golden Bamboo, um, I don't think you can mow enough. I don't think you have enough gas or diesel um, to actually completely eliminate these things. Um, with repeated cutting. Um, you'd be at it every single week for many, many years. In many cases, they have such tremendous energy reserves. Burning in general, burning has not been effective for literally any of these species as a standalone tool. Okay, Grazing is all over the place. Still grass, highly undesirable to most grazing animals and wildlife. Common reed, will, cattle will readily graze it, but uh, to get effective control, the heavy grazing that, that you need is often results in a lot of non-target damage. Miscanthus is grazed readily in Japan, and they actually graze it in agroforestry situations and do a pretty good job there. We haven't really done as much of that type of work here in the U.S. Kogon grass very high in silica with very uh, sharp leaves that are very undesirable to grazers. You can force cattle on young new growth, but uh, if you are forcing them to eat it, they're certainly not doing very well. Arundo, there's almost no information out there. There's a lot of anecdotal reports that goats and sheep will really go after it when it's small. And, um, and, and so in terms of management, uh, if you are able to use goats and, and uh, can get it within their range, um, they will go after it. Golden bamboo, again, is grazed by all classes of livestock if they can reach it. So once it gets above, they'll create a browse line around bamboo patches, but they, they uh, are not going to be able to, to climb it very well. Hand pulling. For microstegium, very effective before seed production. It is nearly impossible to hand pull any of these perennials unless it is a brand new 
infestation from a single rhizome piece that's been cut for the most time. When you hand pull any of these perennials from established stands, if you can even do it, you break off the shoot from the rhizome and often get very little of the rhizome mat to come up. Very difficult. Digging, uh, not needed for stilt grass and literally we're talking about major excavations for ry of rhizome removal for maximal effectiveness, and heavy machinery is often going to be required. I challenge anybody just to take and go measure out a one, one square meter area, a meter by a meter, and hand dig all of the rhizomes of any of these species out of that, out of that area, and then determine the feasibility of expanding that to larger patches with hand labor. Exceedingly difficult. We have dug hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Kogon grass rhizomes. Um, and uh, it, is, it is incredibly difficult. Arundo rhizomes are very woody. Golden bamboo, very woody. Miscanthus, very woody. Uh, common reed, not quite as woody, but just exceeding, exceedingly difficult to even get a shovel or a pick into a, a rhizome mat of any of those species. In terms of the promises of biological control, this is really a frustrating thing for grasses. We have very few biocontrol agents. I'm talking about classical biological control going back to the native range, searching for insects or disease that are host specific to the target weed, testing them uh, excruciatingly before bringing them over, releasing them here in the US and hoping that they have some negative impacts. For still grass where there's none available, there is, there has been observed reports and you'll often see these for bipolaris, a uh, uh, pathogen or some different insects. Um, none available for common reed, miscanthus, or kogon grass. Uh, for Arundo donax, Tetramesa romana, stem boring wasp was released back in 2009. Um, and so, and golden bamboo, really none available with very few reports. One interesting thing for miscanthus and Arundo, the, the probability of biocontrols will go down even further if they are become widely utilized as bioenergy crops, because that would be in direct conflict. Uh, with the goals of a good biocontrol program because it would require, it would be like introducing a new pest into a new cropping system here in the U.S. So not likely. So the problem with biocontrol, it's often been focused on broadleaf species. So many grasses are closely related to some of our most important agricultural com grass commodities um, and that has made finding very host specific uh, pests or host specific insects and disease uh, for these weeds, extremely difficult. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing. Um, the, the concerns of, of non-target damage and escape and movement is, is, is a concern. We've had some fantastic examples of success and some, some very big mistakes we've made in the past with biocontrol. I don't have a lot of hope for biocontrols for most of these species. Okay, let's stop right there uh, in terms of these management before I get into herbicides. And I know we got started a few minutes late, Tom, but we're definitely going to get our hour in here for your credits. So do we have any questions at this point on non-chemical control or management of any of these species? And I will get into integrated strategies that utilize both, uh, both uh, physical controls and, and herbicides. The only other response we've gotten is from Peter Connaughton, who commented that not weed is reported to have vitamin C. Okay, no not, questions. Okay, not weed. Yeah, so the polygonum species, not grass. Um, are, they're not grasses in general, but yes, I've heard that before too. Okay, so folks are, are itching to uh, itching to get to uh, uh, herbicide questions here. Okay, here we go. All right. So the reality is, after after many many efforts of utilizing uh, and implementing a lot of different physical controls, uh, we do often use herbicides in a lot of situations. The lack of selectivity is really a big problem in, in many areas because we're trying to manage of an invasive and highly diverse areas, and we want to minimize non-target damage, and we want to do the best we can with that. Um, I always have to say this, the herbicide label is the law. You must read and follow it uh, because uh, it is a legally binding document. If you're looking for technical support from companies, you're going to find it varies widely uh, from company to company. Histor in the, in the 1990s and two, in the first decade of the 2000s, uh, we had companies that were much more heavily invested in invasive plant control that, that have now kind of backed off from that some. And uh, a lot of companies are heavily in, focused on agronomic production. And so you're just going to find widely varying technical support in terms of products. Okay, 
herbicides widely used for invasive grass control. I've put together a table here, and, and I've got a couple of tables. This is not all of it. Far and away, the, the number one active ingredient utilized for a lot of invasive grasses is glyphosate. Uh, you may know it as Roundup Pro, Accord Concentrate, Rodeo, uh, Aquamaster from aquatic uh, habitats, and, and about 300 generics out there. Tremendous number of glyphosate species. Some of the key points that I'm going to bring up here in terms of uh, recommendations is, depending on where you're at in the country, and, and you, you will find different recommendations in terms of herbicide rates and application volumes for spot treatment and foliar broadcast. For example, you can find uh, PA, and these are the uh, Latin names, the abbreviations Latin names. So PA is uh, Phragmites australis, AD is Arundo donax. You can see Roundup Pro and, and, and some, some glyphosate formulations recommended at 1.5% volume to volume for spot treatment. Miscanthus uh, or Microstegium viminaeum at 2% volume to volume being very effective. Other folks suggest Arundo Donax needing about a 4% uh, volume to volume solution of, of, uh, of a Roundup or glyphosate product. And Imperatus cylindrica or Kogon grass at about a 4% solution too. Golden bamboo is, is much higher typically in that 5 to 10% volume to volume range. Um, and I will say that even with those high concentrations, uh, golden bamboo is unbelievably difficult to kill with glyphosate. So it is going to take many, many applications to do it. Foliar broadcasts are often um, for glyphosate products, for microstegium in, in about 1.5 to 2.5 pints per acre. For the rest of these perennials, you're literally going to be up in the, uh, in the range of, of, of close to a gallon per acre for a lot of products. Uh, between uh, two quarts is on the low, and I never have a lot of faith in two quarts of any of the glyphosate formulations for creeping perennials. At best, I think you're going to get a lot of suppression, but it, you don't kill as many rhizomes with the lower rates. So most of the time, you are up around literally four, three and a half to four quarts or to five quarts per acre, depending on the species. And that alone does not completely kill the entire rhizome mat uh, with glyphosate. Um, historically, you may have heard Roundup kills the root. Well, yeah, it does that very well for annuals, but it does not completely kill rhizomes, those creeping underground stems. You can watch them die. It takes a long time. Oftentimes, you can watch rhizomes die for two to six months following a glyphosate application. But in general, as a rule of thumb, for, for spot treatments, you're often somewhere between about 2 and 5% um, volume to volume um, applications for a lot of these, these troublesome uh, invasive grasses. <clears throat> now, glyphosate is non-selective, uh, has no soil activity. One of the most important things is uh, the formulation you're using in relation to being labeled or not labeled for aquatic use. Many glyphosate formulations that have a surfactant package built in are not registered for use in aquatic environments. It is the surfactant package that causes, uh, that has aquatic toxicity issues with regards to fish and other aquatic invertebrates. And so anytime you are working around water with, with glyphosate, make sure you're using an aquatic formulation and always add an aquatically approved um, uh, surfactant that will help improve absorption into the leaves. Because without it, aquatic glyphosate alone does not absorb very well, the, the, the plain molecule. Um, no soil activity with glyphosate. And so uh, especially within natural areas, uh, you're not getting any residual control from it. Um, and it's only effective on what you foliar, foliage-wise you spray it on. The other, probably the 800-pound gorilla, the most powerful grass herbicide that I think we have is a, is a mazapir. And this is a compound that you have to be very careful with. If you're, a train, if you're in forestry, you're going to use this widely in terms of site prep and, and at lower rates for herbaceous release or, um, or treatments like that. Two pound per gallon formulations of a mazapir would include like arsenal, chopper, polaris, habitat. Habitat being the aquatic formulation. And oftentimes for foliar spot treatments, you're going to see, uh, you're going to come in around 2% uh, volume to volume for those two pound per gallon materials. Some folks recommend less, um, but for the, the, the deep rhizome systems, again, a mazapir, uh, I, I still like to be at about 2%. For foliar broadcast applications at uh, three to four or four to six pints per acre is where you're going to need to be. Uh, for, for foliar applications. Amazapir, tremendous soil activity, 
This is not something to play around with under desirable hardwoods or literally around any desirable species um, as that soil activity can be taken up um, and you can get significant non-target damage. Um, so you have to be very careful in using uh, Amazapur products within forest systems. Within the conifer systems, uh, things like loblolly pine, of course, very effective. Uh, you have to be very careful in longleaf pine and, and, and slash pine especially. Hexazinone or Velpar, uh, excuse me, let me go back. Arsenal AC, the forestry product specifically, is a four pound per gallon formulation. And so you can literally typically cut the rates in half uh, for, for, the, for most of these uh, perennial weeds because it's double strength. For Hexazinone or Velpar L, typically another forestry product. It has been utilized for bamboo uh, as a soil treatment, not necessarily a foliar application, but uh, applied, a spot treatment applied in a grid pattern uh, within the stands. And um, that is a, a very slow treatment to work uh, as the bamboo takes it up from the soil, repeatedly defoliates. Um, Amazapic is an active ingredient found in plateau and generics like Impose and Panoramic for Microstegium. Uh, for foliar treatments, four ounces per acre has worked very well. It's also worked as a pre-emergent material, getting it out before microstegium starts germinating, or the combination of amazepic glyphosate, which is journey, and uh, you want to be in that 10.7 to 16 ounce per acre range for microstegium. So these are these are some of the key herbicides um, that are that are, are utilized for grass control. The graminicides. These come up a lot in terms of how effective are they? Is it worth my time to use them? And uh, you often hear them called the fops and the dims, and that has to do with their, their base chemistry name, um, like phenoxaprop, fluazifop, uh, clethodim, cethoxidim. Um, but you'll see products like Acclaim, Extra, Fusilade, Select, Vantage, or Post, and there are others out there too. Okay, these are very specific to grasses. They affect an enzyme uh, that is insensitive in broadleafs, and so you can kill grasses with them um, without hurting broadleafs, which is really nice to have that selectivity. The labels with non-crop areas vary among these products. So if they have a non-crop label, then they're going to have frequent utility, um, primarily for microstegium control, okay? And so they, can, they vary in their effectiveness. All or most will be effective at seedling stage. Some of them are effective up to pre-flowering. So you also often have a pretty good window over the summer to use some of these products. They do vary. They are generally weak on large rhizomatous perennials. Now some of these are effective on Johnson grass, but when you get into things like Kogon grass, uh, Phragmites or, or bamboo, uh, typically they just don't effectively translocate throughout the rhizome system and kill it. So they translocate to those uh, the growing points within the within the shoot apical meristems and kill those shoots. But you, you get you get shoot burned down, but then you typically get pretty pretty rapid resprouting, um, and they just they fail to completely kill the rhizomes. So for for annual grasses, for microstegium especially, they can have a really good fit and increase your selectivity. And there's been some data out there to suggest that they uh, they actually um, can result in a little bit better uh, control and uh, release of native species than than glyphosate treatments. So these things are definitely something to look at. Sometimes they're pretty expensive, though, and that can be a limiting factor in their usefulness, um, especially within natural areas. Now, spray additives are always a big question. These are additional products added to the spray tank to improve absorption um, and, other, and other things that are generally required. NIS is one you'll often hear of, non-ionic surfactants. You never need to go above a half percent volume to volume, but NIS is often a very good choice uh, to add, um, and the labels will specify them um, in terms of adding about a quarter percent volume to volume of good non-ionic surfactant. MSO or methylated seed oil, very effective and very useful for certain formulations of, of amazapir, uh, like Chopper Gen 2, and uh, can also be useful with Plateau. Crop oil concentrates are another one often utilized with uh, some of those fops and dims uh, in terms of uh, um, selective annual grass control at about a 1% volume to volume. Herbicide labels are going to dictate the best additive to use. Um, you may need other additives depending on your situation with glyphosate. Ammonium sulfate uh, can, can be used if you have very hard water or you have above 200 parts per million, uh, especially calcium. And, 
Some pH stabilizers, colorants, or spray dyes are very useful for spot applications. Emulsifiers and drift control agents, uh, not so much um, in terms of uh, spot applications, but uh, in terms of broadcast applications, these things are also useful. And there are several others out there. But the label will typically recommend what you need. Now, what about optimal timings for herbicide treatments? And I want to focus on the perennials here. We often talk about late summer into the fall uh, has been widely shown to be the most effective window for herbicide treatment of a lot of our aggressive perennial grasses. Oftentimes we talk about treating Phragmites at flowering, Arundo uh, at flowering. Golden bamboo is not going to flower, but uh, um, Kogon grass uh, flowers. It's, it's kind of bizarre and flowers extremely early in the spring. It's one that is uh, not link up with flowering, but it does link up with late summer and fall treatments being most effective. Here are the problems with waiting. Some things just get too big to treat with ground equipment, and especially for backpack spray crews. Phragmites can get very tall. Arundo can get overhead. Golden bamboo is going to shoot up fast. And, um, and waiting till late summer or fall, uh, you're just unable to get over the top of it at that point. So you've got to start spraying earlier. Too much acres to treat within a short summer fall window is a problem for a lot of folks, and you've got to spread out your applications over a longer season. Uh, you need your crews working for longer spray season than just the summer, late summer and fall. And of course, weather, weather, weather always throws a monkey wrench into the best laid plans that we have with regards to uh, whether it's drought, whether it's excessive rainfall, uh, whether it's uh, uh, inclement cold weather coming in, especially in the fall. These things can always frustrate. So one thing this will tell you though is if the standard is late summer fall treatments, when you start to deviate from that, you may begin to see less effectiveness uh, the earlier the applications. I'd never recommend treating perennials in the early spring because that is when they are pushing growth upwards and uh, you just don't get very good control with most of our herbicide with glyphosate with the mazapir treatments treating that brand new growth of perennials in the early, early spring. Oftentimes we want to wait until there's there's a couple of feet of regrowth minimum, and for things like Phragmites, maybe waiting until it's four to five feet tall. Times to avoid spraying, clearly. If the grass leaves are rolled up, that's drought conditions, do not spray. If rainfall is upon you and you know it's coming, and the rain fast period is going to vary by herbicide, but it's nice to have several hours before rain. We used to say we'd love to have 24 hours. Labels will often now specify rain fastness within sometimes four to eight hours. Um, for glyphosate, uh, if they have surfactant packages built in now, they're, they're pretty good at having a relatively short rain fast period. If you have lots of soil activity, say using a mazapir, a little bit less important, but a mazapir is still largely foliar active. For heavy frost, and we talk about applying in the fall, I love to see about two to four weeks uh, ahead of first frost if possible when you're treating perennials uh, like this because uh, Oftentimes, a heavy or killing frost can really shut down herbicide translocation downwards. And the closer you get to that, especially for um, further south you get where plants are more susceptible to frost, um, the better it is to have about a four-week period if possible. If the label says do not spray, and this is, you know, in heavy wind and things like that, then you've got to follow that label. Now, let's, let's wrap this up pretty quickly here. Um, we're a little bit over, but we're about at an hour. Integrated strategies, why do them? Okay, so often I talked about cutting, burning, and mowing, how they're typically never standalone. We do often integrate them in with herbicide treatment. What are we doing here? Number one, trying to get it to a manageable size. Number two, dealing with that thatch, litter layer, that decadent growth that can often inhibit herbicide uh, treatments. Uh, number three, stimulating new uniform growth that's going to be easier to get through, easier to recognize and uniformly spray. Number four, those things can help you access very dense infestations so that you can work your way into an area you just couldn't even get into before. And number five, reducing below ground energy reserves and then following that up with a treatment when photosynthates are moving downward. Ideally, theoretically, doing any of these cutting, burning, or mowing operations to allow treatable regrowth in the late summer and fall when plants are storing energy below ground, that's probably about the optimal way to integrate these things. Now, I know that's often difficult to do and we're limited with, within the seasons, which we may be cutting, burning, or mowing for many reasons, and it doesn't always work out perfectly. Um, if you're doing winter burns, you'll often find that your regrowth comes back much more vigorous and you cannot wait until fall to treat. 
if you can uh, implement uh, early summer type uh, cutting, burning, or mowing regimes, a lot of times it's a really good in terms of getting a good size regrowth towards the late summer for application. It varies by species tremendously. It's, it's, it's not something that is very simple, and it varies within the conditions you're working in. But uh, this is really why we would recommend integrated strategies. After herbicide treatment, do not be too hasty to mow, cut, or burn. Okay, so what you want to do, you've invested in a, in a very expensive herbicide in a lot of cases. If possible, you want to wait for your shoots to be crispy all the way to the ground. If you cut or mow those things off prior to that happening, you are reducing the potential for some downward translocation. And so as a lot of these perennials die from the top down, uh, especially with the mazapir type treatments, um, you really do not want to sever, cut them off, as that herbicide often translocates very slowly over a month or more, some, and you see kill expressed over a couple of months even. So don't be hasty in terms of following, uh, following up uh, just to clean up a site. Let the herbicides work. Finally, why doesn't a single treatment normally eradicate anything? This is, this is what we face and why we often push programs, adaptive management, and following up with additional treatments, because even short-lived seed banks will have some seed that delay emergence and escape. Leaf area and shoot growth, as I mentioned before, and I hope you've sort of gained a picture of the massive amounts of underground growth. Oftentimes our leaf area is just not adequate to get enough herbicide to below ground parts. And then when your below ground parts are filled with dormant buds, um, they're not active transport sinks and they often do escape treatment. And finally, environmental conditions at the time of treatment can greatly locally influence outcomes, whereas you see very good control um, in specific patches and very close by, a couple of days later, you don't see as good a control. That can come down to applicators in some cases. In other cases, there's just random environmental variation out there that results in uh, that we can't even explain to date. So to tie it all together, uh, the reality is uh, effective management, we've come up with effective management for most of these species. Bamboo is probably the hardest of all of these to get rid of. But understand and ecology in terms of reproduction and really what you're dealing with below ground for these perennials can really help um, in terms of, a, of beginning to address them better. Do not ever expect silver bullets. If anyone promises you silver bullets with a specific treatment, don't believe them. And finally, invasive plants are a persistent learn-as-you-go process. Uh, we've done, there's tons of research out there, but there's always more to learn. And applicators themselves can literally learn as much as the researchers can, adapt, modify, and press on. Giving up oftentimes can result in going back to square one. And so single annual treatment programs where you spray it one time and walk away from it, I guarantee you, you will almost always go back to square one within two to three years. I do recommend a management guide for invasive plants in southern forest. It's not comprehensive for a lot of the northeast. Uh, but it is a very good uh, guide in regards to detailing a lot of different uh, management strategies along with herbicide prescriptions. This thing is free. You can get it from the Forest Service. You can download a high-quality PDF online um, from the Southern Research Station .fs.usda.gov and go to the publications section. Uh, so with that, um, I will stop there and answer questions um, until we're done. We've got one from Trent Duncan. What is the best way to convert miscanthus fields to forest land where the grass is already well established, 8 to 10 feet tall? And then I think he wanted to follow that up with a specific chemical recommendation. All right, Trent. We've been actually uh, studying this whole business of miscanthus and um, in situations of trying to farm it out. Um, direct conversion to a forest um, can be a little bit tough. We found tillage that breaks up those clumps and lift, separate lift those clumps up. 
um, has been very effective at, at killing Miscanthus sinensis. Um, a single, single tillage typically isn't going to do it, but we've been able to integrate uh, glyphosate uh, treatments to any regrowth following tillage, and that's been very effective at marginalizing Miscanthus as a weed problem. Um, broadcast applications of glyphosate across the top of big Miscanthus like that, uh, we've gone up, up to a gallon per acre, and a single application doesn't always get it. Uh, we often see some survival around the periphery of a lot of those, uh, of those uh, clumps of miscanthus, so I think uh, it's, it's often difficult to get really good coverage, and you do see some survival. The imazapir treatments as a site prep type treatment are going to work pretty well uh, prior, to, um, prior to going back, uh, uh, depending on the conifer you're planting back. And so those are two very good options. If you can get tillage in there from Miscanthus sinensis to get it below and lift up those uh, clumps, they do not tolerate that very well at all. And that's one of the reasons we don't see Miscanthus as a major agricultural weed problem because it can't tolerate tillage. David Dimmick has what looks like a comment. Improving tidal flushing of marshes discourages common reed. Common reed will tolerate brackish water but not salt water. And I guess that's experience from Cape Cod. Oh, I'd love to hear things like that. I love to hear those types of folks who are figuring out management strategies where, um, where <laughs> if you are capable of doing tidal flushing, then by all means, um, if it, absolutely. So I think that's great, and I love to hear that type of stuff uh, coming from uh, land managers around, especially up on the East Coast. Thank you for that, David. Uh, Nathan Gatlin. Uh, Gatlin Wilkes, last year when we had a lot of rain, microstegium seemed to explode. This year it has not been raining as much, and the microstegium does not seem to be as much of a problem. Are my perceptions correct? Does microstegium need a good amount of soil moisture to choke out its competition? Well, it does, it does germinate with, with, with very good soil moisture. If you're in drought conditions, we often see a lot of annuals um, that, that occupy moist forest conditions are are delayed or uh, reduced in their abundance that year. Don't throw, don't, don't assume you've gotten on top of the problem just because of that, and you'll often see these, these situations that it will come back like gangbusters when moisture comes back. I think you may have already answered this, but what, is, what about a grass-specific herbicide such as Clefidem? A absolutely, Har Harley. Um, the FOPs and the DEMS, they, again, they, they have very good fits, some of them do for the for microstegium. Um, Clefidem has activity, I mean, it, it, it's clearly registered for several perennial grasses. Experience has been in terms of the heavy the heavy hitter grasses uh, with the very deep rhizome and, and abundant rhizome layers like Kogon grass, um, Phragmites, uh, bamboo, and, and Arundo. It, it tends to burn down shoot tops, uh, but it does not hold them back. It does not fully kill the rhizomes. So uh, selectivity-wise, yeah, it's, it's very, very good within forest systems where it's labeled um, for, uh, for microstegium control. Sierra Ward asks, do you recommend cutting bamboo prior to spraying it? Okay, so this is, a, this is um, a really good question. I didn't fully get into this. One thing to be careful about in terms of hand labor with bamboo is the condition called histoplasmosis. And here in the deep south where you have blackbirds roosting in bamboo, um, we have often recommended literally using respirators, like a class two respirator for, for any, any hand labor within bamboo. Um, in terms of cutting it, number one, if you've got a really tall stand of bamboo, it's going to be very difficult for you to get any type of uh, herbicide application over the top. Um, the bigger the bamboo, the harder it is to do in that case. And so we, it's often recommended to mechanically Cut it all down, whether using a mulcher or if you can bush hog across it, which is often tough to do, or hand cut it, and then treating the regrowth. The big problem with doing that, and it's, and it's, highly, it's often recommended, but uh, again, you're trying to spray it when it has very little leaf area because uh, otherwise it, it overtops you again and gets ahead of you again. And so you're trying to put a bunch of herbicide onto a very small amount of leaves to translocate down to a massive rhizome system. And we often say that uh, with glyphosate applications, um, many, several, ap many applications, maybe up to, you know, at least six or seven applications sometimes of cutting and spraying. Um, bamboo is something I'm working on right now. I've got some research projects where we are trying to come up with the absolute 
uh, most effective uh, way to for for land managers to get after it. I think there's a there's a really it's still a big black box on optimal strategies. So yeah, I can recommend that. I just it's very difficult, and we don't have surefire ways to get rid of it with glyphosate. Herbicide wise, if you can spray arsenal, amazapir type herbicides, I think they're a little more effective uh, for it. Um, okay. Uh, Mark Hughes, are the graminicides formulated and packaged for homeowner use? Okay, there, boy, um, I want to say that at least a couple of them are. They're oftentimes not going to be easy to find, certainly not at the box stores. You might find some of them at feed and seed stores. Um, I want to say a claim extra is probably one that you might be able to get your hands on uh, relatively easily, I think. Um, and so I think you can, but in, in general, um, they're not restricted use per se, so you can go, you could go to a pesticide distributor and purchase. They would probably want to sell you at least a two and a half gallon jug, maybe two, two and a half gallon jugs minimum. Um, but, uh, and some will have smaller container sizes. Um, so you can get them, they're not restricted use. You may, state labeling may require you to have a pesticide applicator license to get them. Guy asks, how do you deal with treatments when your neighbor has a problem and does not treat his infestation? Yeah, that, that, is, a, that is a major frustration, Guy, and, and um, I think that there are thousands of land managers who re relate to this all over the U.S. Um, attempting communication and education, uh, trying to get them on board in a more cooperative way of, of, of addressing things is very important. Um, going with the approach of spraying across the fence Sometimes it works, and sometimes you can get a lawsuit on your hands. So you have to be very careful with doing things like that. Um, if it's bamboo, um, trenching um, is, is, is something, um, and dragging your neighbor out there and repeatedly show him that his bamboo is growing across. Some of these, some species may be subject to state noxious weed laws that you might be able to get regulatory involved in other places that absolutely is not going to happen and nobody's going to lift a finger in to help you in that direction. Um, I always try try the open communication before confrontation. Um, that's that's really about the best I can I can give you right now. Patty asks, what's the best herbicide for re eradication of reed canary grass? Okay, so back to this reed canary grass question. I didn't really cover cover that one specifically and that has been a really difficult species to deal with. Um, the FOPs and the DIMs have been utilized, and, and, and research data has shown they often you see a, quite a bit of regrowth following application of those to reed canary grass. Glyphosate as an herbicide um, is effective at, at burning it down. You, you kill some of the rhizomes. It requires repeated treatment, and you can have um, seed germination, uh, I believe, uh, recovering from. So. So that, that's, it's, it's a very frustrating one to get a hold of because the selective options for control and reestablishment of species are much more difficult for that. Um, so um, that one, <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's go through these other questions and I'll see if I can. Sure. Um, where does Japanese knotweed fit into this outline? Okay, excellent question. It's not a grass, uh, so it's in the Polygonaceae. And I know Japanese knotweed and a few other knotweed species are a nightmare of a problem across the northeastern U.S., across the Pacific Northwest, um, and down into the, the, the mid-Atlantic states, even into western North Carolina. Um, and so this presentation was not specific to Japanese knotweed, even though somebody, some people have mistakenly called it Japanese knotgrass in the past. And I'm going to have to to hold off on answering too many questions about that. As another species that is very strongly rhizomatous, um, it is, uh, folks have, have attempted to go after it with Roundup or glyphosate applications. More effectively, a mazapir um, it is very good on Japanese knotweed, but if you're going after it with glyphosate, it's going to require repeated applications. The same type of, of cut it down, let it regrow, and, and treat it at, uh, at flowering uh, has been a strategy a lot of folks have utilized. Uh, we do have a few different species of knotweed out there, and, and, and they, they don't all die equally, um, but those are two approaches to go after it. Anna asks, what herbicide would you use to treat Japanese stiltgrass on a meadow and prevent native grass damage? Okay. Um, well, okay, so your best options for selectivity, um, some of the FOPs and the DIMs, 
uh, you're going to get some non-target damage on perennials, um, but uh, they, they're about as close to selective as you're possibly going to get without spot applications. So read the labels very closely on, on what uh, grasses will tolerate some of the fops and the dims in terms of your natives. Um, I know it's not always going to be clear. You might reach out to your local uh, local extension folks and uh, re university researchers to see if they have any more local expertise with that. Um, I have not directly gone after Japanese stiltgrass out in open meadows. It's always been uh, in wood situations. Um, but uh, I think in terms of selectivity, that's one of the, the fops and the dims may be as close as you can get because glyphosate is, is certainly not going to be there and imazapir wouldn't work either. Andrew asks, is there a guide to management of invasives in northern forests? Also, how long does reed canary grass la seed last, and is there any good way to treat this species? Oh, boy. So there comes the reed canary grass. It sounds like, uh, it sounds like you need to get a reed canary grass uh, seminar. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> right. <laughs> um, okay. So, again, uh, as I mentioned with Japanese, with uh, reed canary grass, glyphosate, and, and imazapir options. The seed, uh, you know, I'm going to have to look that one up too because off the top of my head, I, I, um, I am not exactly sure. So let me, uh, I'll try to look that up very quickly and then come back to it. Um, okay, keep going here, and I'll come back and to that. As a, as far as a guide to management invasives in northern forests, I also was going to ask if you there's a particular online resource that you recommend for lots of answers on invasive plants. Okay, uh, Anthony DiTomaso at Cornell is doing a tremendous amount of research uh, on a lot of forest invasives uh, up, in, up in northeastern forests. So I'd probably go to the Cornell website first and see what's there. Um, in terms of a specific uh, management guide, uh, one is not coming right off the top of my head there. Um, Okay, um, Bob Howe. Okay, here, okay, here we go. Oh. Back to the seed banking of reed canary grass. Um, well, it definitely can last for more than a year. Um, yeah, so what I'm, what I'm reading here is that uh, there can be a very small percentage, can be maintained several years, but you're going to have a high degree of turnover in the first couple of years. But there can be some that can, uh, can hang in there for a few years for sure. This is from Bob Howe. From a non-botanist on Long Island, is there any thought of using certain invasives along shoreline areas to help minimize storm erosion from storms? I realize it is the opposite of what we're trying to do with controlling these species. Absolutely. There's always an engineer out there, and not to bust on engineers, who, who view the best species that the stabilization is more important than the species itself. So you can run into those arguments quite a bit. Um, one thing that's utilized widely uh, is in the south and in, in the more in the warmer parts is something called vetiver grass, um, which uh, which has kind of been a, an amazing grass in a lot of third world countries that's shutting down soil erosion and resulting in tremendous stabilization. Um, further further up the coast, I'm sure that a lot of different things have been tried, and I I don't know specifically that far, but I understand where you're coming from, being in Long Island there, and what you guys have experienced. Um, Anna asked, would a complete cover of bamboo with landscape fabric and a thick layer of mulch for an extensive amount of time kill the bamboo rhizomes? Um, okay, in terms of covering, typically running plants uh, with rhizominous running growth will outrun the edge of your fabric, so they will, they will grow beyond your ability to cover everything, and they will come up right at the outside edges of it. And so... Um, in terms of exhausting its energy reserves by keeping it covered and shoot suppressed, it would you would literally have to do that for a few years. Solarization, um, covering it with say a bright pla a clear plastic, and trying to allow the sun to solarize or kill uh, those rhizomes. Um, typically, solarization does not heat the soil deep enough to completely kill the rhizomes of, of deeply rooted or deeply rhizomatous species, because solarization only typically works a few inches down and those rhizomes will survive beneath that. Uh, so, yeah, if you're going to cover it, boy, it's going to take some time. And oftentimes, if you're using plastic, that plastic is going to degrade before, uh, before you've effectively starved out, uh, starved out those plants underneath it. So it's a, it can be a long process. John Tate asks, are there any cost share programs to help get rid of invasive species? Cost share programs, okay. Depending on what state you're in, 
um, and, and depending on where you're at. Um, so NRCS does have a couple of programs that invasives do come up in, um, which, which vary from state to state. The Wildlife Habitat Incentive Program, WIP or EQUIP, uh, Environmental Quality Incentive Program, invasives that come up under that for treatments. Um, they may not, uh, you, you have to be enrolled within their programs to qualify, and uh, they, they have to be supporting the control uh, or spraying of the specific invasives that you have. Beyond that, um, weed management areas, which do exist uh, throughout a lot of areas of the country, um, have often, uh, um, where you have a, a group of landowners working together, have been able to compete for uh, pulling together uh, grants, which can provide some financial assistance for management. Um, in terms of an overall comprehensive federal program for, for uh, providing landowner assistance, it just, we don't really have it. And uh, it's, it's one of those things that um, it's not a priority for Congress. Uh, my best suggestion with uh, financial assistance programs is to contact your local USDA service center. They're going to have the most experience and the most up-to-date information. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, from Justin, bamboo. I'm trying to remove a 13,000-square-foot patch of bamboo. Back in March, April, we mulched the 10 to 15-foot tall shoots to the ground using a bobcat with a forestry cutter. I plan to return in the fall for herbicide treatment. This was a bamboo monoculture, but it's near a stream. Do you recommend a certain herbicide treatment, and do you have any experience with mulching bamboo before herbicide treatment? Well, mulching would be like cutting, um, and so what you're doing is you're, you're getting rid of that top growth. And uh, you did it right at the time that it was shooting up new growth. And so you've probably seen quite a bit of uh, emergence of new shoots from the rhizomes coming up after that. So when it is fully leafed out, if you can get over the top of it with an herbicide application, if you can safely use a mazapir, um, and, uh, and if you're near water, habitat would be an option that would be approved for that, you will probably get the most bang for your buck out of, a, out of an application of habitat. Um, uh, across the top of that bamboo. If you can't use that because of uh, the soil residual aspects and, and nearby trees, uh, glyphosate is, 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 kind of the, or is kind of the second option. And for a, a spot treatment, I would literally be about, about between 5 and 10 percent on a volume to volume basis spraying across the top of it. I'll tell you what, Justin, if there is any way that you can get a root rake onto that site, which would be, say, getting a heavy, heavy equipment, a heavy dozer. We often say a D9 and a root rake. Um, a root rake that lifts up those rhizomes out of the soil uh, is the most effective way to control bamboo. Um, it's not a perfect solution, but uh, getting those rhizomes up out of the soil, piling them and burning them um, is really a, the best thing you can do, and a root rake is the best way to do that. Even, even some types of tractor mounted tillage implements uh, that, that, that can get under those rhizomes and lift them up, because they're typically relatively shallow. Um, but dig down and see what you're up against. Um, and uh, if you can do that, then by all means, root rake it out. We're going to take one more question, and uh, it's from Lisa Huff. Is any federal money going into use of these grasses for bioenergy? If so, why can't it be stopped, given the executive order against this? Oh, uh, okay. You have, Lisa, you have entered into a very gray area right there. And I'm not, I don't know, I'm trying to think back if the EPA has finally ruled on whether or not they would allow um, Arundo Donex as a bioenergy. I know they've delayed it several times because that's been very controversial. Uh, the miscanthus thing has also been controversial, but there are other forms of miscanthus, like, um, let's see, miscanthus sacrofloris, I think, um, that do not produce viable seed that are also actively being utilized in terms of bioenergy. Um, but that is a great question, and it's a uh, um, and it's something that uh, folks are wrestling with big time. If it's not on the noxious weed list um, and not, not a regulated species, then, the, then um, there may not be limitations to using it. Some states have, have, uh, have, have sort of dealt with this, like the Florida, by mandating that if you're planting over a certain acreage, just a couple of acres of any crop for bioenergy, it has to be approved by the state. And so they've been able to regulate uh, planting of some potentially invasive bioenergy species that way. But in terms of a national consensus on the use of some of these for, um, for bioenergy versus their invasive potential, it's not out there. And we have a history in this country of, of, of utilizing invasive species for bioenergy. Chinese tallow tree and tongue oil tree are two classic examples. 
literally brought in for bioenergy purposes, where massive plantations were planted, that industry dried up uh, overnight with industrialization, uh, and, and the southeast was left with massive tallow tree and tongue oil plantations. All right. Well, I really, I'm, uh, it was just wonderful to see uh, so many people come on board for the presentation. I hope you were able to